So it's time to move on to the sixth resource person. Mr. David D. Perodin, Established Language Specialist with the Institute for Population and Social Research, Mahidol University in Bangkok, Thailand, where he teaches academic reading and academic writing for the social science for master and doctor students. He is also the journal manager for the Scopus in this journal of population and social studies with the same institute. During his tenure, he has acquired several prestigious teaching qualifications and certifications along with a Bachelor in Secondary Education with Honours and a Master of Arts in Teaching with Honours both with concentrations in English. He is currently a doctoral candidate pursuing a PhD in Applied English States for English Language Teaching at King Mongus University of Technology, Tonburi, Thailand. We feel delightful to invite Mr. David Perodi to this platform. Hello. Over to you, sir. Yes, hello. Thank you for, thank you for the wonderful introduction. And uh, the speaker before me, I'm, there is no way I will do that that well. So <laughs> great. Uh, I would like to share my slides if possible. Let me see. Uh, okay. Uh, one second. Let me see. One second. Okay. Um, hmm. Oh, a window. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay, great. Um, can you see my presentation? Yes, sir. Okay, great, 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 great. Okay. Um, I was asked today to, uh, to speak a, a little bit about academic writing, or more specifically, the, the information flow within academic writing. Since, since, this is a, uh, since this is a conference where several people will be presenting papers, uh, presenting their their research, I thought I would quickly focus on an element of, of writing that that I find so many people uh, tend to um, overlook, and especially with novice researchers and novice writers. Okay, this is this this is me. Uh, I have been teaching academic writing for several years now, and I have been living in Southeast Asia for. Um, a large part of my life. I have, I have experienced just about any issue you can imagine uh, in, in academic writing. So let's, let's, let's look at just a few things. But before we begin, I would like you to know that the best teachers are those who show the students where to look and, and do not tell them what to see. My teaching approach is very much like this. I like my students to explore on their own with my guidance, but I, I found if I tell them exactly what to see, then I'm just making copies of me, and I would not want to do that. So very quickly, let's touch on discourse topics. Now, when we are looking at academic writing, we are looking at discourse. Discourse is simply is simply text, uh, written text, uh, spoken text, conversation. Richard Watson Todd wrote a wonderful book called Discourse Topics. I, I, I would strongly suggest anyone, anyone who has an interest in writing or speaking or research or linguistics would look at this book. Watson Todd said that discourse topics are a frequently mentioned but rarely operationalized concept. I added in written and spoken discourse. Because they are. A discourse topic is, is simply, it, it's simply the central information of an interconnected discourse. So any type of genre, academic writing, any type of storytelling, uh, magazine articles, uh, newspaper articles, anything like, like that is considered an interconnected discourse. Well, the information flows throughout this discourse. I'm going to focus on written discourse because that is, that is what I teach. Spoke, spoken discourse, I suggest you search for Grice's Maxims, G-R-I-C-E, Grice Maxim, M-I-X-I-M. Uh, look, look at look at Grice's maxims 
if you want more information on spoken discourse. But with written discourse, information flows throughout the discourse, and it's carried through the discourse by grammatical structure, but nouns, verbs, etc. And this information flows from sentence to sentence and paragraph to paragraph and on. Now, how, how to help this information flow? How to help information flow throughout our writing without loading our reader's mind with so much, with so much things, so many things that they have to remember. Well, cognitive load. Cognitive load is the amount of information that a reader's working memory has to hold at one time. Cognitive load. Now think about this. When you are reading anything, when you are reading a text, if you have to think, what does the writer mean? Or what is the writer trying to say? Or what did the writer, what is this about? That is increasing the cognitive loading. And reading is not very much fun when the writer does not clearly communicate. Again, reading is not very much fun when the writer does not clearly communicate. Now, a, a reader's working memory, it has a limited capacity. It does. I mean, think about it. Uh, I, am, I am half a century old. Yes, I am. And believe me, when I was 20, I was reading 450 words per minute with full comprehension. Now, yeah, right, I would dare not try. But the point is, we need to make reading fun for everyone. And we need to make reading where it's not, where it's not difficult to follow what the writer is trying to say. So I, I teach my students a very simple platform, uh, a pattern, if you would like to say called Given New Information Flow. Now, Watson Todd discusses this in his book, Dis Discourse Topics, and it's a little advanced for, the most, for most readers. So let me try to break down Given New Information Flow in a very simple way. Now, like I said before, I teach academic reading and academic writing for graduate students for, uh, for master's and PhD level. Both, uh, both individuals who speak English as a second or a foreign language and some who speak English as a first language. But it does not matter what, what ethnicity or what nationality or what first language. It matters on the language competency or the intelligibility to use the language or language proficiency. So let's, let's go. In information flow by the given new pattern, it really does establish a smooth flow of ideas. Smooth flow of ideas. Now, given, given information, given information is information that the reader already knows, or common information. For instance, earlier, uh, the speaker was asked a question about the current coronavirus sit situation, and they said, the coronavirus is a global phenomenon. Yes, now that was a very beautiful in introduction because the speaker presented information that everyone knows. Given information or old information, when we begin our speeches or we begin our presentations or our writing with a sentence or information that the reader should know, it connects the reader to our writing, and that is what we want. We want our readers to feel so comfortable. Now, look at this example. Look, look at this example. Um, this is actually from Swell's, Swell's book. Research has shown that caffeine does indeed reduce sleep, sleepiness and can lead to better academic performance. Now, if you look at, sen at sentence one, you can see how the information very easily connects to sentence two, and on and on. Now, we see that, we see that the given to new pattern of information should flow within the text. And like I said before, starting the text with familiar information, 
given information and repeating some information uh, from the previous sentence to the next sentence using uh, using nouns, pronouns, synonyms, even antonyms in some cases. Varying the parts of speech helps the reader to follow what we are saying, and it helps the reader to follow our ideas. Now look at, look at sentence number two. Sentence number two repeats the word caffeine. It, it, it repeats sleep, sleepiness. It also talks about students. Well, look in sentence one, it discusses academic performance. Well, academic performance connects to, to students for anyone. So what the writer is doing, the writer is connecting in, he, they are connecting information. And when we connect information, when we connect in information from sentence to sentence throughout the paragraph, it's very easy for the reader to follow the flow. And if whenever we do research, that research is important to us. Well, you know, look, every time I do research, every time I write an, an, an academic article, it becomes my baby, my investment. And I want to make sure I communicate my, my investment of time and energy to the reader. And the better information flow, the easier that information is communicated. So look, look at sentence number three. Again, it is discussing caffeinated, and it is also discussing prolonged sleep onset and reduced sleep efficacy and depth. Great. That, that ties again, it ties again to we're talking about sleep. And again, talking about affecting both sleep quality and duration. Great. We know caffeine reduces sleepiness. And we see throughout the text how the author is connecting, connecting sleepiness, alertness, caffeine. Now, in sentence four, they introduce coffee or other caffeinated drinks. Now, when in sentence five, when we mention caffeinated drinks, most people, most people know that coffee, unless it is decaffeinated coffee, but regular coffee has caffeine. And caffeinated drinks, people know, people know soft, soft drinks, uh, tea, coffee, these are caffeinated drinks. And most people in this world, they know about energy drinks. There's, look, every country has energy drinks. And these drinks, they're, they're just loaded with caffeine and sugar. So if you see how the author follows throughout this whole paragraph, connecting sentence after sentence, topic after topic, you can see a very clear flow of information. And this clear flow of information helps the reader to easily follow the writer and easily follow the message with minimal cognitive loading. That means the reader doesn't have to remember whatever the author is trying to say. Now, if you look at sentence number six, sentence number six, an acronym is beginning the sentence. Now, we know in academic writing, we should not begin sentences with, with either acronyms or abbreviations. We know that. But at the end of sentence five, the author introduces the acronym for functional energy drinks. So reintroducing the acronym at the beginning of sentence six is fine because it is very closely connected. If, the, if you are trying to begin a sentence with an acronym, and the acronym was introduced very, very early on in the writing, you will alienate your reader. Alienate, separate your reader from your writing. You don't want to do that. So it is perfectly fine to reintroduce acronyms, reintroduce acronyms in every major chapter. At the beginning of every major chapter, the first time you use an, an acronym, reintroduce that acronym using the full term. It is fine. It is not redundant. It is avoiding alienating your reader. It is, it is avoiding that cognitive loading. Because sometimes I read academic articles that have, my goodness, a dozen or so acronyms. 
And sometimes it is, it is very difficult to follow acronyms, especially, especially when the letters are very close. It's difficult to follow. So reintroduce acronyms, connect the information throughout the writing. Now, in sentence, in sentence number six, they, the writer mentions mental and physical performance. Well, if you go back up to sentence number one, you see where the writer mentions better academic performance. See, the writer is connecting information throughout this whole text. And that, that creates cohesiveness where, where all the information sticks together. And it creates a clear context of the text where the information is flowing and following. Now, in sentence seven, you see, they reintroduce the, the acronym, but now they, re now they introduce ingredients. Now, that the ingredients becomes new information, but of course, in sentence eight, they restate the word ingredient. So now everyone knows what ingredients the writer is talking about. So I would like for you just to take a, just to take a quick moment to look at all the arrows and the underlined words within this, this text. And you can see clearly, clearly how the information flows and how the writer connects all of the information. Now, let me, let me give you a little piece of advice, especially for novice researchers. When I write, I will edit and re-edit and edit four or five, sometimes six times before I submit my manuscript to the journal. Now, I have, I have a red pen or a red pencil. I print my manuscript and I go through my manuscript and I, and I underline or circle or draw arrows just like the example here. And I see how the information, I see by drawing arrows and circling and underlining, I see how the information flows through my text. Sometimes when we write, we kind of overlook, we kind of overlook uh, our, own, our own writing because you know, we see it so much and we just, we just really don't see any, any issues. So I use that. I use the red pencil to, to represent an outside reader. Or maybe, or maybe if you have friends, if you have friends who can, who can read your articles and give you some advice or connect the information, that would be nice. Now, my time is almost up, so let me leave you with with a, with a with just a very sincere piece of advice. Sometimes, sometimes writers like to use this or these to connect information, but they often do not add a noun. Look at sentence nine. If this relationship can be explained, more effective FEDs could be developed. Now. The relationship is talking about the, the ingredients with how, how these ingredients together affect alertness. Now, if sentence nine, if the author, if the author only wrote, if this could be explained, if this could be explained, that is how most authors write. They forget to add the noun. If if this author only wrote, if this could be explained, that would create an unclear antecedent or information that is ambiguous. Any information that is ambiguous or unclear increases the cognitive load of the reader, and you will alienate the reader if there's too many things in your writing that they do not understand. So, again, if the writer fails to add a noun after this, this or these, the, 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 the antecedent will, not, will be unclear. And again, you alienate your reader. So, to connect paragraphs, you can simply carry the information from the, from the last sentence of, that, of the first paragraph to the first sentence of the following paragraph. It's very easy. I just showed you one paragraph, how the text connects, how, how it sticks together, how the text is cohesive, how 
the context of the writing is clear and easy to follow. Now, when you connect sentence to sentence and paragraph to paragraph and section to section by the use of information flow, using preambles, using, using introductions before each section, your reader will follow you and your reader will enjoy reading your text. Look, we might be the best writers in, well, not we, you might be the best writers in the world. But if your reader has difficulty following your thought processes, following the information flow, it doesn't matter how, how good of a writer you think you are. If you do not appeal to the reader, then whatever you write will be lost. So practice, practice information flow. Practice reading your article and, and highlighting how the information flows. Because the truth is, do, do not limit a child to your own learning, for he was born in a different time. Most, most Generation Y and Generation Z individuals are reading our research. And Generation Y and Generation Z their attention span is a little more limited than it was with previous generations. And, you know, that is due to technology and this massive amount of information that they receive. So write for your reader. Do not increase the cognitive load of your reader. Try to write to where the information flows well and the information flows easily and your reader will appreciate you. So if anyone needs to contact me, you can contact me via, via Facebook uh, Messenger. Send a message to me if you would like to discuss in information flow or if there's, there's, there's anything else I can help you with. And now I am going to go back here and try to stop sharing. So thank you, sir, for giving your wonderful presentation about in information flow within written discourse. It's a useful presentation for everyone. You give us a little picture about where we have to use noun, pronoun, and all. So thank you, thank you so much.